All right, guys, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Just a reminder, let us know where you're coming from. Uh, remember, if you want to be contributors on platforms like this, uh, whether it's a webinar or a blog post or a contract teardown or whatever you feel excited to share with the community, we have the resources to help you to do that. I'm actually really excited uh, because we figured out a whole process for uh, and brought the resources together to create substantive ebooks. I mean, they'll be they'll be big guides. They'll be really useful, handy guides for different subjects. So if there are subjects that you want to be known for, uh, we would love to have you uh, participate and join us. Um, we Just shoot us an email at community at lawinsider.com and we will um, be able to, to share your wisdom. And as an aside, uh, I'm Mike Whalen. Uh, I wrote a book called Lawyer Forward, which you could see conveniently product placed here next to baby Yoda, you know, that's what professionals do. So uh, I, it, at, on the Lawyer Forward podcast, actually, there's a series that I did, a podcast series called The 90 Day Known Expert, in which I talk about why you should share your wisdom, how sharing your wisdom builds it and creates that sort of known expert status. So uh, you guys go listen to that. You'll understand the why behind it. And uh, you'll be excited to send me an email at community at lawinsider.com and share your big brains. So what we are going to do today is a webinar about force majeure. We are in the middle. I literally got back a negative COVID test today. Uh, it's all coming. Man, the kids are about to go to school. It feels like we're starting over. We're all wearing masks again. Um, so it's getting pretty hectic here. And the force majeure cases have had enough time from you know early in this process to actually get through some courts. And so we brought on uh, Professor Farshad Gadusi to talk to us about force majeure, the state of those cases, uh, what's going on in contract language, what's working, what's not. Um, and uh, uh, yes, the uh, to Travius, uh, we will uh, give uh, uh, links later uh, for what you're asking for once we get started. Uh, so uh, Farshad Gadusi, uh, professor, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna read a quick bio. Uh, Farshad Gadusi is an assistant professor of business law at David Nazarian College of Business and Economics at California State University, Northridge. He received his doctoral degree from Yale Law School, his master of laws from Yale and Berkeley, and his PhD in international relations from Florida International University. His Bachelor of Laws and BA in English came from the University of Tehran. Farshad has practiced as an attorney in global litigation and arbitration, and now serves as an expert on issues related to contract law, international law, and comparative law. So what I'm gonna do now, Professor, is actually turn the time over to you. Uh, before I do that, I wanna give you guys a couple of housekeeping things. Um, you, you, you're all commenting on the side, on the chat, and that's excellent. You guys can essentially talk to each other over there. That's what's great about that area. To ask questions of the professor, what you'll want to do is down at the bottom, there is a Q&A feature. Uh, if you will go hit that and ask a question, that will make it so I see it so that I can ask the, the professor the questions. And if you see a question in there that's similar to what you were already thinking, you can upvote it. You can say, oh, I really like this question. And that'll help me know what really rises to the surface. So as we go along, uh, ask whatever questions come up. The professor's going to share a presentation, and we'll save about 15 minutes at the end uh, to answer some questions. So without further ado, Professor uh, Farshad Gadusi, thank you for joining us. Why don't you nerd out now about force majeure as you do? Sure. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for joining. I see around 250 people already here. That's, um, that's impressive. Uh, thanks for taking the time. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of uh, a background about this project and why I embarked on it. Um, and, then, and then we get to the nitty gritty of this project and I'll, I'll lay out and flesh out some of the practical implications of it for drafting and generally for contract law uh, that can be helpful. Uh, obviously I'll go over some of the method, um, some of the novel methodological approaches that I've used. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll I promise that they don't they they won't be that long. Um, so force majeure clauses uh, we have known them for many years. We have included them in many contracts. So you, but we really um, got to uh, grapple with them recently. Obviously in the aftermath of two thousand eight uh, financial crisis, and now um, in the aftermath of COVID. 
So <clears throat> the question uh, that that really sparked my interest in this discussion, I'm, I'm, my area of research is contract law and, and business law, business association and related areas, was really uh, about how courts look at force majeure clauses and what do they do? Why do we include force majeure clauses to begin with? And I, I didn't want to just uh, sit down and read some law review articles and some books and, and some uh, doctrinal do some doctrinal analysis online. I actually wanted to do some empirical work based on the court's reasoning thus far. And as you, some of you may be familiar with it, we are lucky enough now that we live in a world where a lot of databases now are, are available that they were not available even five years ago. And, and one of them is this Harvard uh, case law project, which, uh, uh, which makes case laws machine readable. So uh, we, we can do some machine learning and, and machine uh, 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 readable analysis on, on some of the court's opinion and get, a, get an overall view of things. And uh, obviously it has its own limits. So I'll, I'll go over um, some of the, um, some of my findings and the methods. We always have to be aware of the capabilities as well as the limits of, of these methods that we use. So let me share my slides and then, um, and then uh, we take it from there. So the title of my article is called Contracting Risks and it's forthcoming at uh, University of Illinois College of Law Law Review in 2022. And uh, the, I, I really started with uh, three main questions when I started this project. One was, why do parties include force majeure clauses? When you and I contract, what is really the reason that we have force majeure clauses? As you know, contracts generally, uh, what, what is the purpose of a contract? Why do we contract to begin with? It's because I value, let's say, the goods, you, uh, the, the, the product you have more than you do, and probably you value the cash that I have more than I do. So that's really the very basic, simple law and economics approach of contracts. And that's why we transact because we create this world of joint surplus, we increase the pie, we make the world a better place because you get what you want, I get what I want, and we move on. However, contracts serve another function. And that is the, the, um, the risk allocation. We allocate risks. Um, so for and, 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 and risk allocation is a very important part of contracting. So for example, imagine I put um, I have an old car and I, I, I want to get rid of it and get a new one. I put it on Craigslist and somebody offers me 10,000. I said that's great. Um, and come pick it up. It's available on my driveway. And the other person says, you know, it's too late. It's getting too late. Uh, tomorrow I'll come pick it up that night. There is lightning or the, the fallen tree and the car gets completely damaged. Who bears a, a, risk, a risk of loss? So risk of loss is a very important concept in contracts. And for that reason, we, uh, we enter into this world of force majeure clauses. But remember, Remember that common law and many, many other uh, judicial systems in the world and, and legal system in the world, they have by default notions that is very similar to force majeure. And, and, and for example, in common law, we call it impossibility. If something is impossible to perform, we relieve the promisor of the obligation to perform. And one of the old cases is, hey, you're going to perform, um, you're a great guitar player and you're going to perform in this, um, and, and this, at uh, this theater tonight, we have this audience and, and that's great common play and we enter into agreement. There is a fire that, that, that theater or that place gets burned to the ground and it's impossible for the guitar player to play. 
but uh, 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 it's it's not it's not possible at all, physically impossible. So traditionally, um, in common law and many other uh, jurisdictions, we have this physical impossibility that makes uh, the the that that excuse the performance of of a contract if uh, that happens. Then we move towards if you if you look at uh, you want to look at it historically. Then we move a little bit forward and we get to commercial impracticability that we have under UCC, that something becomes excruciatingly or excessively expensive. You can still do it, but the cost is excessively high. You enter into a contract, you're supposed to excavate a place, make it ready for construction, but then there is uh, some unusual um, uh, type of rocks that it just is just impossible to excavate, and uh, you can, but at at the maybe some crazy amount uh, or with unusual tools, it might be feasible. So that is commercial impracticability. That's another notion that we have in, in common law and, 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 and of, of contracts. The other one you might be familiar with it is frustration. Uh, frustration is you can, still, you can still perform, but the very purpose of the contract is frustrated. And we know that old English case that this guy goes and wants to uh, ever rents this how uh, rents this room because it wants to see the coronation of the king, the ceremony. Uh, that's really the only reason that person enters into that lease because he wants to, I don't know, grab um, a champagne, uh, a wine or beer or coffee and look at that ceremony. The, the, uh, the king falls ill and there's the, the, the ceremony is canceled. And the court says, the purpose of the contract is frustrated. The purpose of the contract is frustrated. Remember, in that context, the parties can perform, but there's no purpose of it anymore. Another example of frustration is what happened when this guy, uh, there's a restaurant, I think in LA or somewhere, uh, 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 enter in, uh, uh, to at least a neon sign uh, for, for the restaurant that flashes, I don't know, burger, 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 and then it was, it was a lease. And then it was World War II. Um, I think there was some uh, imminent attack. The government says all lights should be turned off at night. No lights at night um, because of the security reasons. So the purpose of that lease is frustrated because that person really there's no point of, of having that um, a lease of that sign anymore. So we have all this robust theory. Why? do we include force majeure clauses? Why? So that's one of my number, for, uh, the first question that I have. The second one is, okay, let me go and look at the cases. Now that we can actually <clears throat> look at the case law and we have uh, this uh, 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 cases that are machine readable, uh, I, I, I like to see how courts look at it and what are the factors they emphasize on. Because when you read case law, when you read some of the commentaries, when you read the article, some say foreseeability is important. If you want an event to be considered uh, um, <clears throat> fall under force majeure clauses, it should not be foreseeable at the time of contract. You should not have foreseen it coming. And that's why it's false majeure because we are dealing with black swan. We are dealing with something we did not expect. We just started, like, wow, I did not expect it at all. So that's a foreseeability analysis. The other says, no, we look at the language. The other says, talk about control of the parties, whether parties can control the effect of it. So when you read and some others talk about causation, notice, and, 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 and uh, like obviously the contract language matters here, but generally at the high level, what are the main, what is the main criteria and standard of analysis by courts when it comes to force majeure clauses? And, the, and lastly, um, I, uh, in law, it's common that you've got to say some normative, you're going to have some normative 
contribution. That means that you have to make some suggestions. And I have suggestions about the way that the law should go and, and, and proceed in, in this area to be more equitable and more efficient. I will get to that um, at the end. So these are the three uh, inquiries that started uh, uh, I, that, that I focus on in my research and I go one by one here to, um, to discuss them. So why do, we par uh, why do parties include force majeure clauses? I, um, in order to do that, I wanted to first look at the common languages used in force majeure clauses. And, and here databases such as the ones you find in uh, Law Insider can be very helpful because as you know, um, contracting or contract clauses are sticky. That means people repeat them over and over again for a variety of reasons. There are articles about, I mean, some obviously probably efficiency is one, but there's also law and economic, a behavioral aspect to it. So you see common uh, clauses being used over and over again in different agreements. So what I did, I, uh, I wanted to have a randomized sample and I did, uh, I used SEC filings, the material contracts portion. Uh, also, I did some Google search to make sure that it's randomized and, and, uh, and Google for some con uh, contracts in different sectors. And I collected uh, more than 1,000 uh, clauses. And I wanted to do uh, essentially some bread and butter uh, frequency of word to understand the emphasis of those clauses, especially when it comes to the words that I care the most. Um, what uh, I noticed was that uh, you see you have 4C, 35. You have, uh, because I was focusing mainly on foreseeability, control, and, and uh, uh, both or, or none. As you see, as clear from the chart, the word control appears the most in all these sample clauses, more than foreseeability, way more than foreseeability. So the word control is really key when it comes to uh, these clauses. And when I, you, when I, when I uh, say the word control, what I mean is beyond the control of the parties. The event is of, of the nature that is the beyond the control of the party. So the party cannot control the effect of the, of, of the event, the force majeure event. So that, uh, or some variation of it, is very common in these clauses. So why is it important? Why is it important? Um, before I proceed, I want to flag uh, uh, an important po point about the common law. Remember, I, I started by talking about common law. We have impossibility, impracticability, and frustration. And then now we, we see the word control. So if you look at the definitions that's provided in the statement, UCC, uh, of, of those default rules in common law, you notice one thing. Let me read uh, 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 one for you. Um, restatement uh, second, section 261 says, after contact is made, a party's performance is made impracticable without his fault by the occurrence of an event, the non-occurrence of which was a basic assumption on which the contract was made the non-occurrence of which was the basic assumption uh, the contract was made. So I sat down, obviously days, thinking about what is it, why is it that parties do that? Then I really came down to this notion of basic assumption, which you can find, by the way, in all these three theories of common law. Basic assumption of parties at the time of contracting is found in all those theories. Interestingly enough, force majeure clauses do not mimic this language. Do not include this basic assumption language in the uh, in force majeure clauses. And that was the aha moment for me. 
that you know we have this criteria in common law that is not being repeated in force majeure clauses. So parties are doing something here by not including the basic assumption and by emphasizing the word control. So then I, in my paper, I go over the law and economics approach um, of, of, um, of, of this issue and then behavioral economics of it. So in, in law, if I'm gonna go over it very briefly in uh, the um, law and economics say, says, I mean, one theory in, in law and economics says, you have the default rule to incentivize people to contract out of it. So essentially contract something different from it. It's sort of a penalty rule. We want people not to include force majeure, uh, the, the default rule and tailor their contracts to their needs better. That's the purpose of default rules. Um, obviously, the, the, the behavioral economics also have some explanation, including that default rules are, are sticky. I noticed that neither of them are very satisfactory. I go over uh, in detail in, in the paper. I'm happy to do that. It's a bit maybe academic, uh, too academic here, but I'm more than happy to talk about it. But really what I say here at the end is that parties intentionally do that because they wanna move away from this basic assumption to the control factor. And because they're worried about hindsight bias, they are wanna move about move from perceived risk to the actual risk. Remember, everything is predictable in hindsight, <laughs> or at least we have the hindsight bias now. We can say, well, you know, there was a version of a COVID in early 2000, I mean, or, or uh, we deal with pandemics all the time. Look, Bill Gates predicted it, it's foreseeable. Everything ends up being uh, predictable in hindsight, but, but then if we have the basic assumption and similar notions, what we do is to we bring this uh, understanding to the time of contracting. The focus of our inquiry about force majeure becomes um, the, the point at which the contract is made. The party seems to want to be move away from that and focus on the event and its effects more. They do not want to always go back to the time of contracting, but more on the actual event and what it does to their performances. And that's what this move or this sort of elimination of basic assumption does, in my opinion, and I explain in detail in my paper, but for the sake of time, I move on. I'm happy to, to get back to this point in the Q&A. So in query number two, um, I read uh, many, many cases before uh, do this empirical work. Uh, some people call it computational law, some people call it computational analyt legal analytics, some call it NLP. I don't know, these are fancy words, uh, it's used these days. But I, uh, what I did, I explained to you the method, methodology very briefly. What I did, I first read many cases. I obviously saw many inconsistencies, but I wanted to really uh, uh, um, boil it down to the factors that uh, determine or, 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 or the, uh, determine the outcome or the court's focus on. And then I noticed that we can come up with three predictors when it comes to force majeure clauses. One is foreseeability, the other one control, the other one control uh, contractual language. In other words, when you read the opinion, you can say, well, this, 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 uh, 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 this case is really ultimately is hinged on whether the event was foreseeable or not. This case, the court really focuses on whether the parties could control the effect of it of the outcome of the of the um, force majeure or not. In oh, this case, really, the court is looking at the contractual language to see what the con, uh, con, con, what the parties meant. And in the paper, I go over um, uh, in detail all these three factors because these are very fascinating factors themselves too. Um, for example, foreseeability. 
Uh, it really depends how you look at foreseeability. Are you are we just saying that if something is foreseeable at the time of contracting and that's enough? So, for example, we all know that at some point, God forbid, I live in California, but there's going to be an earthquake in California, right? We all know that. Um, is that enough them to make it foreseeable in all the contracts that I sign and, and therefore... Um, um, the earthquake in California is foreseeable in all California contracts. Is that something we view as foreseeable? Or foreseeability is really foreseeability of, of the effects of it, like how, how it's going to impact the, um, the, uh, uh, um, the contract. Or, or I can see the uh, uh, earthquake is coming, but I probably am not going to exactly know what's going to happen when the earthquake hits, what are the consequences of it? Um, and I go over the, the uh, different cases and what, what I found, and I wanna really cut down to the things that might be interesting to you, uh, uh, but obviously more details are, are in, in, in the contract, is typically um, when I've observed that generally speaking, if courts accept, for example, in governmental action, there's a lot of cases about governmental action. Say, you know, there was a government mandate. It was unforeseeable. It was beyond my control. The government shut down. The government did this a new regulation. The government did this new order. I didn't expect it. There's a lot of cases like that. Um, what I noticed was um, if courts accept uh, governmental actions as a force majeure event, usually it is based on the control standard. They say, yeah, I accept your argument for force majeure. Uh, it's because it was beyond your control. And usually when they want to reject the force majeure argument, they focus on foreseeable. They say, yeah, it was foreseeable for you. You could you could you should have seen it coming. So then then you get a little bit into um, legal realism that you know some of these standards are wrought really for the courts to deploy to get to the results they want to get to um but i discuss all that in details um um and uh, what you see essentially after the uh, financial crisis is that courts tend to um uh, uh, avoid or, or um, uh, essentially reject force majeure arguments when it comes to uh, finan uh, f uh, a market fluctuation. Market fluctuations, they tend to um, uh, make it outside of the purview of force majeure clauses. So with these predictors, I came Professor, up with- Actually, can I, can I get you to step back? Because maybe, and maybe this will sort of mold where you head with it, but I, I had a question from Bridget uh, Prescott Frank that I think is relevant to that previous slide, if you want to step back one, uh, which was, should contracts include language specifying COVID-19 related events um, so that they're covered under force majeure? Would pandemic or act of the government, like a government shutdown, be enough? So it seems like you're talking about two sort of you know, there's the behavioral economics, how to use the contract in order to mold behavior, and also what the court's going to do, which so you might have a different answer to these. But now that it is foreseeable, again, you could debate whether it was foreseeable before, like you said, with Bill Gates predicting this, would you change, like, would you advise an attorney to do something different now that the foreseeability has changed? Right? Does that make sense? That's that's a that's a great question. That's a great question because I've seen some of the cases that even included the word pandemic, endemic, and 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 endemic, and didn't really go the way that the uh, the um, uh, the uh, the party included it wanted. So let me take a step back. Do not think, at least based on my research, that just including something in the contract is the end uh, is the end game, because what I'm doing in this paper and I'm explaining today is that there are factors, other factors that come into play when it comes to the analysis of force majeure clauses, one of them being foreseeability. The other one is control. Yes, you might include COVID-19 in your force majeure clauses, but the court might say, well, you know, the effects of it, you could have controlled. Yes, you have COVID-19 in your force majeure clauses, or pandemic, 
but you could have control the effect of it. Let's say a restaurant owner say, you know, COVID-19, I cannot pay my rent. So, but you know, you could have put the, um, put the chairs uh, and the table outside and do uh, curbside delivery. So my, my point here is that one, one common uh, uh, idea about force majeure is that let's include everything there and and then and then we're gonna be all safe and and, and sound. Um, but what I'm saying is that it's more complicated, as I'm going to explain. And the courts is they're going to look at various factors uh, for their risk allegations. Language contract language is very important. Um, obviously, the more granular it is, the more specific it is. Uh, the better is like, uh, regardless, if, if you really want to tie it, make it tight, if the other party agrees, regardless of whether it is within my ability or not ability, if there is any sort of government shutdown of any nature related to COVID-19, I'm relieved of liability. If you have, if you can include language like that, then that's a separate story. But the standard language that we have right now it's not gonna, I mean, obviously uh, people are using it, including it, that's a common practice now, but it's not the end of the story. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So then uh, what I, what, what, what question that I, what uh, uh, one thing that I was really curious about is that whether at the type of event has any sort of uh, bearing, has sort of in consequence on the type of reason is the, the court provide. I thought it would it would be the case. So if you have earthquake versus labor strike versus terrorism versus governmental shutdown versus economic hardship, financial crisis, that has to have some uh, relationship to the court reasoning. So I categorize the type of events, and then I talked about as I talked about I, I included these three predictors for court's reasoning. And for the case outcome, I had to hand code it, which is a, which is a difficult thing to do. I hand coded a bunch of um, uh, cases. So the idea was we have the event, does it lead to any specific sort of reasoning by courts? Does it lead to any sort of specific outcome in terms of accepting the force majeure argument or rejecting the force majeure argument? So that I created a dictionary because that's what you do if you want to do computational law, at least in this fashion for all of this. So what I found was more and more, if you look at the case, oh, by the way, I looked at the cases from 1810 until 2018. So uh, it's a large database of cases that dealt with the issue of force majeure clauses. So anytime, there was a mention of force majeure clauses that is in my database. So that's a large database, large history. So when you look at it, uh, it's, um, it is, uh, what you see is that increasingly, we have cases more and more involving economic hardship and governmental action. So more and more about financial issues and downturn, uh, or, or uh, market fluctuation and governmental action. For those who are in, in drafting, that's something that might be uh, helpful for you to, to know that really these cases are under rise and these are the issues that become uh, the subject of litigation, governmental action or economic hardship. If you wanna have a more tailored language in your contracts for these two issues, obviously the other ones are here as well. Well, Professor, let me uh, step you back just one slide. Melissa asked that you show the dictionary of terms. Uh, it, as you're categorizing these, so th what you're seeing here on the right, these are the words that are coming up based on your categorization of these different variables, acts of God, accident, major, minor, or whatever. So these are the words that you're using to sort of, you said you hand-coded these, which is something. No, not these, uh, sorry. The okay. outcome I hand-coded, the outcome, because... One thing, Mike, is, uh, is interesting. I mean, at this juncture, I don't know, uh, you're in the industry, but what I understand is that you cannot come up with definite uh, mass uh, 
uh, data for outcome of cases, except reject for force majeure clauses. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult because you have to read them and see what the court ultimately says. But in terms of, but these things are for creating variables. So whenever I have the act of God, that variable has captured the weighted score of the number of times these terms that you see on the right have mm -hmm. appeared in court's opinions. Got it. And so your next image of the events is, you know, you see these normalized curve, mm. or the, you know, these straight lines of the, of the average increase. And so that top, if I'm understanding correctly, that top line that you see really increasing over time, that's, that's your categorization for government action, which included things like regulations, government, governmental. Exactly. Action. Got it. Okay. And sorry, yeah. next, the next slide you were, you were looking at the reason for um, the intent and the language. Yes, ahead. yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, perfect. Th th no, thanks for this. Um, Clarificatories, uh, qu clarificatory questions are very helpful. Um, so um, events uh, is the next one I looked at. Um, uh, sorry, I, yeah, uh, reasons. The type of reasons that you see, uh, again, based on the frequency or weighted score of the frequency of words of the uh, reasoning that I, as I explained, foreseeability, control, and contractual language. You in fact see that the intent and contractual language are on the rise. So you see more and more courts use the word intent and use the word um, uh, contractual language in these cases. However, that's, that doesn't mean there's a co correlation. Correlation is different, we get to that. That's just the trend. Now we get to the correlation analysis of these things. So again, let's go back to my question. My question was whether uh, any of these events, right, the events that we discussed have any sort of relationship, a statistical relationship to the type of reasoning. So we can say event, any type of events leads to a specific type of reasoning. My, um, uh, the correlation analysis here shows that the factor uh, control is positively related to all other variables, but uh, only foreseeability and language are positively related to two of the events. So uh, in other words, as, the, as courts engage more with force majeure issues, they're more likely to deploy the control analysis and less so analysis related to foreseeability and contractual interpretation. Let me, let me go to the next slide because these, uh, this needs a, a, a more explanation. I, 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 let me get to the direct effect. There is no direct effect between the type of event and reasoning. Unlike what I thought at the beginning, the type of event, let's say strike, governmental action, shutdown, uh, terror, you cannot say because we are dealing with government shutdown, the courts are going to use foreseeability more. Or because we're dealing with COVID-19, they're going to use control more or contract lack. There is no direct, there is no statistical uh, significance there, okay? However, when it comes to indirect effect, which is what explains the relationship, mediates the relationship, control becomes significant in almost in all of the events. You have uh, control as a mediating factor, not language, not foreseeability. What it means is that and statistically, the result shows that control variable always mediates the relationship between the event type and the weight score of force majeure. In other words, the question about control explains why there's a relationship between event and the weight score of force majeure. So no direct event between the event, let's say strike, um, governmental action, and force majeure argument. But if you can, if you can see here a, a, a triangle, the, it, it has a relationship between control. In other words, courts use control to do the analysis of, of force majeure clauses. Okay. That's really what I'm, what I'm yeah, getting. Yeah, I want to I hammer that because, so if I'm trying to give my client statistically informed, like, hey, here's your risk, here's your liability, here's what courts are doing, 
Yeah. What, t- tell me, tell me how I would advise, you know, in this current environment, right? It exactly. sounds like what you're saying is control is the principal variable that a court will cite. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly correct. You are more likely than any other factors out there to deal with the control language if parties are litigating force majeure clauses. So if you're drafting a contract, if you want to uh, give advice, you have to think about the way you phrase the control in, if you phrase it and how you phrase it in your contractual language. If you do not phrase it, there is a likelihood, similar to the, as, the, as my study shows, that the courts engage into control analysis no matter what. They get to see, hey, can the party control the effect or not? If you're going to draft it, then you want to you want to maybe limit or sort of sort of um, uh, 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 morph it in the way you like. You say, yeah, you know, if the if 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 you can say maybe uh, beyond the control of the parties. Dot. The next sentence is if dealing or uh, or dealing with the effects of the force majeure is um, is still within the control, but is ex- excessively costly. That is still um, following. Yeah, the- I was I was going to say there's a question yeah. from John Foster that I think is is interesting and relevant to this. I, he says he represents clients that plan meetings, conventions, trade shows. They sign contracts, performances a year or two out. Uh, the issue, you know, timing is another factor. The meeting planners can't wait until the day of the meeting. Like, I I'm assuming that that has more to do with foreseeability, right? Like, that if you're three days out, I mean, come on, you 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 know, you've known about this thing for the last year, you could have prepared for this. When you add these other factors, are, are you seeing trends that change that for a bit? Specifically, obviously what everybody's thinking about is, you know, COVID is much more foreseeable now. Should yeah. I be including that in contract? Should we be hammering that out in our negotiations? Should we make that clear? It sounds like what you're saying is even the foreseeability of that specific event is not going to be the determining factor. It might change behavior to your earlier point, right? Uh, but it, it doesn't sound like the courts are going to really weigh yeah, things but, very differently. So we still are, are going to see a lot of COVID cases coming. I mean, there, there, there are cases, uh, as you know, being litigated now. So maybe uh, that's going to change in my analysis uh, in, in two, two years' time. But what I can tell you now is that do not the, 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 don't think the languages that exist out there and are being rep, rep, replicated are sort of this t- uh, 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 perfectly packaged language then, then that, that you don't have to deal with when it comes to litigation. Because it seems that the courts, based on my analysis, look at the control. They look at the foreseeability, but they place a huge uh, uh, factor on control. And I'm going to actually explain this. Maybe that's also uh, helpful to answer some of the questions. When it comes to jurisdiction, remember my analysis, we have more force majeure clauses in federal courts than any other jurisdictions, obviously. And after that, Louisiana, Texas, New York, Puerto Rico. So essentially a lot of cases that determine the force majeure clauses analysis as we know it coming from Puerto Rico, New York, Texas, Louisiana. And this is slide that might be helpful for some of the questions that you raised uh, uh, earlier as well. It also depends where your case end up because I ran the uh, a moderating effect uh, on the cases and it shows that the control factor is much stronger in state courts. In other words, state courts tend to use the control factor more than federal courts. So maybe in federal courts, they pay more attention to contractual language foreseeability, but state courts really uh, my, my analysis suggests that show a uh, 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 place more emphasis on the control factor. And again, quickly b- uh, back to what you uh, what you asked me, Mike, earlier, is really um, what what people have to be uh, uh, cognizant of is to the extent they can, they they uh, uh, make the contract language more specific, exactly they want. They probably only want to avoid terms like beyond the controls of the parties. Because then you are in this realm of that I'm talking about. You can be more specific beyond the control of the parties. What does it mean? Foreseeability, what does it mean? 
explain, elaborate, uh, at what level it becomes beyond the control of, of a person, at what level it falls below that level. And then by doing that, you can avoid uh, some of the uh, uh, incompleteness of, of contracting that we have. Well, um, Professor, we're coming up. I, I want to make sure that we have time for questions, but I, I'm looking through your slides and I'm, I'm seeing the results summary and your last inquiry, which I think is really important, which is what's the best way to do this? So uh, if I can get you to jump to those, sure. um, we can wrap that up. And then we've got some really good questions that I think might even Absolutely. deal with some of the things. That so I'll talking. skip some of the other ones. I'll get to my uh, last inquiry, which is what is the most uh, efficient and equitable approach? What uh, essentially here, I, I tell you in two minute, maybe five minute max, what I'm saying. Imagine two college students, okay? The first college students go and, 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 and see the college campus, look at the facilities, look at the gym, uh, look at the pool and say, I love this college. I'm going to enroll in this college. I love the facilities and go and, and, and rent a place close to campus. The other one doesn't care about any of that, just cares about the reputation of the school, goes and enrolls in that school. COVID happens. They both have to take the classes online, okay? Both sue to get the tuition back and, and, and based on the force majeure clauses and, 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 and other factors. The law as it stands treats these two students the same. We do not care about promises expectation from the contract. The focus of force majeure clauses historically and now has been on promisor's ability uh, um, uh, to control and and, uh, and 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 foreseeability, we do not that much, uh, we do not care as much about the uh, the promises. What I'm here, uh, what I'm explaining here, and I, I talk about the Columbia University's case that is ongoing litigation, and then a few other cases, gap, a store gap, is we have to move away from this zero sum game. You either excuse a party from. Uh, performance or they have to perform. Uh, and then you focus on promise source mainly in this context. What I say is that we need a more balanced approach by taking into account promises reliance on the contract. Rem uh, remember those two, two college kids? The first students wanted to enroll because uh, the professors didn't love the facilities. The, the second one didn't care. The law treats them the same when it comes to force majeure. Either they are relieved or not relieved. The outcome um, uh, can can be different depending on the court. But what it what it's important is that we do not care and we do not distinguish the two because we don't care about the degree of reliance of promisee on the contract in the force majeure clauses. And that's what I suggest normatively the courts should do. And maybe at the contracting and drafting stage. That's something that lawyers can enter into contracts as well to make sure that the promises or, or the expectations of, of parties are also taken into account for a more balanced and equitable and efficient approach. And I stop here. That's awesome. Thank you. And if, if I remember right, uh, you have a draft version of this paper up on SSRN right now, I think. Yes. Uh, and we'll make sure to include that uh, for you guys so that you can get the full information. Uh, at this point, uh, we've got questions. They're digging more into the substance. I know, obviously, you were doing a quantitative analysis of sort of what's a trend, uh, but there's also some substantive questions as well. Um, and so we'll get to those. Just remember, guys, uh, we've got about 12 minutes. You can ask questions in the Q&A section below at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and uh, you can upvote the questions that have already been asked so I know which ones to go through. And what I'm going to do is just sort of go from the top, uh, the most popular ones, and move my way down. So, uh, Professor, and, and, and if some of this stuff is outside the scope of your research or whatever, feel free to answer that, and we'll take that as a signal that we need to add some more resources to Law Insider later to answer some of these questions. So, uh, Brian Schmidt says, uh, and Lisa Haley responds to back it up, have you observed any trends in a SaaS solutions provider carving out subcontracted third-party data center failures? Uh, argument for doing so, data centers have become ubiquitous and are akin to a utility provider. Uh, are data center failures considered within a party's reasonable control? So uh, it sounds like this control element that you principally focused on you know, first parties any idea, any kind of trends, anything you're seeing on 
on third parties and, and what was within the reasonable control of the contracting parties? That's, a, that's an excellent question. I probably don't have a very satisfactory answer to it now, but what I've seen is uh, when it comes to third party, um, that's, uh, that's really something that um, the courts really don't uh, buy into that to the extent I have seen it, not in this context specifically, um, uh, because that depend it depends how the party allocated the risk in the contract, especially when it comes to third party performance. Um, that may be a bit beyond the foreseeability. Uh, sorry, the force majeure clauses that mainly link to acts of God, government shutdown, and all that. So that's something that. Uh, I, I, I probably, um, uh, I don't probably have a satisfactory and definite answer to it now. Yeah. Um, uh, Concepcion asks a more, maybe more general question that you had addressed very early in the presentation. Is there a way, is there a formula to determine commercial impracticability? Obviously the more, <laughs> the more uh, specified you are, the better in terms of, uh, because commercial impracticability mainly, uh, uh, when you notice when you look at the cases are mainly referring to the, uh, to the cost and, uh, and excessive cost is something that you, you see a lot in court cases. So you wanna maybe define excessive costs and prohibitive costs and at what level do you believe that performance becomes prohibi pro, uh, prohibitive due to excessive costs. And that's something that maybe you can have a, have a threshold or, or a tiered approach to make it more, um, uh, 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 more palpable. Uh, obviously the excavation example that I give at the beginning, that's an example of a, of a, of a case, um, but that's something you can definitely more uh, narrow, more based on the party's negotiation and, 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 uh, and, 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 and drafting. Johnny asked the question and we've addressed it a little bit, but I, I, I think he's got an interesting twist on it. What are your thoughts when a vendor or supplier proposes including epidemic or pandemic as a force majeure event in a supply agreement? Meaning does that specificity, like would you as the contracting, you know, the buyer, uh, would you prefer to not have that kind of specificity in there? Does that create, you know, once you are literally foresee, you know, you're defining the foreseeability. Does that change the control analysis? Would you include that kind of language in a supply agreement? If the vendor and supplier proposes pandemic, obviously, and if you're the you, you're receiving it, so that's something that they they want to make sure that they don't have to perform when there's a pandemic or an epidemic, and um, or at least they're not in breach when that happens. Um, so it's really it depends on your negotiation <laughs> negotiation power. Sometimes what I think uh, parties can do generally in force majeure clauses is to have some ex post exit ramp that you don't see often. Say, well, if something of this nature happens, let's engage in renewed uh, good faith negotiation. Let's reform the contract in this or that fashion. Let's suspend the, uh, the obligation on a, until a later date. Because another problem is sometimes if it's a total excuse, the contract ends. Sometimes you just want to suspend it until that pandemic, endemic, that problem uh, is, is resolved. And then that party still is under the obligation to perform. If you have it, if you include it as such, when those things happen, gone, zero sum game, no obligation, the end of the story. You want to have some via media uh, or, or sort of uh, uh, um, a third approach that opens the door uh, if things of this nature happen. Happens. A uh, friend of the show, uh, the Contract Teardown Show and Contract Teardown star, Eric Rutel, uh, asked the question, isn't it simply correct to say that parties, this is getting back to your question about is the common law enough? Why, are, why do we even have these clauses? Isn't, simply, isn't it simply correct to say that parties include a force majeure clause in their contracts to allow the occurrence of certain events which wouldn't qualify as a force majeure event under common law to excuse performance? So it, I, if I'm understanding Eric's question right, it sounds like he's saying like you put the force majeure in there because you're trying to create an extra, like you said, escape hatch 
for the stuff that wasn't common law e. But now by starting to list that stuff, have you created for yourself the obligation to list all the things, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than relying on the common law. What's your, what's your sense now that you've done this research on why do we even do this? Why do we yeah. use force majeure clauses? That, that, that's actually an excellent question. And here, here, here's a, a very brief answer. Um, why do they then include acts of God? I mean, traditionally acts of God, when especially destroys the subject matter of the contract, that is the bread and butter of force majeure clauses. But we still have acts of God in force majeure clauses. We still say, say earthquake. We still say uh, lightning. We still say tsunami, all of those things. So we include that. And uh, so if the purpose was to expand the type of events that's covered, um, I think maybe, maybe that was the, some purpose at the beginning, but probably not anymore, especially that even common law moved away from this tight notion of physical impossibility and expanded it to commercial impracticability, frustration, and alike. So that may be a partial explanation in, in the past, but I, 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 I don't think that's a full explanation. A doctrinal question from Sylvia that, that actually might be the next level of your research uh, because there's language like maximum extent and best efforts. Uh, Sylvia asked, with respect to duty to minimize the impacts, to what extent the party invoking force majeure must endeavor to mitigate or minimize the impacts? Do they have to use reasonable efforts, best efforts? What if it's too expensive but not impossible? Uh, Sylvia then adds, I've seen many contracts with the to the maximum extent language would courts impose best efforts in this case, or can the party invoking force majeure still rely on reasonable efforts? So again, it sounds like the adding a force majeure clause might actually create a next level problem for you. Yes, uh, that exactly, you exactly. And that that's something that I have to, uh, uh, that's a great question to, as you mentioned for the next project. I did not see it in the clauses that I looked at, um, I did not see it in uh, some of the uh, cases that I looked at, um, even if that, uh, I, I don't know what big of a trend is, um, but to the extent that it's a trend, I think those terminology that you mentioned, again, it's opening a Pandora box of having all sorts of uh, new inquiries or new analysis of what's the maximum or have you done the maximum effort? What's the reasonable effort and not effort? But that, that's something that I really have to dig into uh, more systematically and, and rigorously. Sorry, I'm filtering through a couple because we just have a couple of minutes. I'm just looking at the other questions to see what jumps up. Uh, Michael Purvis, uh, non-ironically says, this is all very academic while I'm speaking to an academic. Um, everyone knows that control and foreseeability language must be addressed in force majeure clauses. Can you get to suggestions about language to be inserted in real world force majeure clauses? So going back to that dictionary of terms uh, that you had that were arising, um, I, I guess I'm sort of wondering is like, since control is the the, the thing that really courts are relying on, are there words that you can use in that dictionary, in that list that will satisfy that control? You know, what kind of words should we be adding? Um, which again, that, that might be a, a list that we can provide later, but um, it, you know, it's not a bad question. Michael's obviously trying to get to the practical, like, what do I do yeah. with this? So to Michael, I respond uh, three things. One is, yes, it's academic. Two, uh, what what really this research, at least part of it shows, is uh, the, the level of emphasis that the courts put on which factor, because you can put three factors, four factors, foreseeability, in 10 language, but the courts look at control. And that's something that that is very helpful at the drafting stage. When you know that the emphasis of the court has been so far mainly on the control factor, you want to make sure that the control factor there is more specified to the best of your client's needs. If you just simply repeat beyond the reasonable control of the party, you're again going to this vortex of the cases that it's out there, not clear. You want to specify how do I uh, make it more palpable, more, more concrete when it comes to uh, what is a reasonable control of a party? How do I define it? Maybe even 
get rid of this language and make it more, uh, 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 say, if, if, if this event happens and I incur 10%, 20%, 30% of the cost, I, and that's, for, that's, that's, that's beyond the control and, uh, and that, then, then I'm excused, something to that effect. Got it. Well, I appreciate it. And obviously we can continue to have this conversation. I've got more questions. Um, I've got questions myself, much less in the uh, open Q&A area. Um, we, I think that there's maybe, maybe professor, there's a conversation to be had about, hey, we're gathering a bunch of data so that you can advise your clients well about what are likely outcomes. It sounds like what you're saying is none of this data should be interpreted as if you put magic language X into a contract, then magic outcome Y will happen. I mean, again, it, that may be obvious to people, but it, it sounds like you, dear lawyer, do not have an obligation to find the magic language. It does not exist, right? Your job is to do your best to, to, uh, to say what needs to be said, uh, to, to give you an argument when the time comes. But um, if people want to follow up with you, Professor, and learn more about this area, obviously the paper on SSRN, I included the link in the comments, we'll include it at lawinsider.com slash resources. What's the best way for people to reach out to you to really dig into this? Absolutely. My, my, uh, my email is available on the, my website, forshad.gudusi at csan.edu. Also, I have my Yale email that I always use, forshad.gudusi at aya.yale.edu. I'm available. I'm more than happy to connect. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, please feel free to shoot me a message, uh, and I'm happy to continue this conversation. Well, thank you, Professor. Thank you all for joining. We will see you next time. We'll give you more information. Pay attention to your email. Stay tuned to lawinsider.com slash resources. Again, let me know if you want to be a contributor of any kind, something academic like this, but also the Contract Teardown Show, where we just make jokes and pick on contracts, uh, blogs, eBooks. Like We have ways for you to contribute. Uh, if you'd like to, just reach out to us at community at lawinsider.com. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you again, Professor. Thank you. Have a nice day.